Um, all I knew was hard work and and through hard work I think my my efforts were were recognized you know and and and, and this is what I say to this is why I say to to other people you know when when you work hard it doesn't go unnoticed people see it and you will get the support that you need you know um, so you're never alone and even though yeah it comes down to me as a person to work hard and get the job done there are people around us to help us all the time. There will always be somebody. And if you don't feel like there is, it won't go unnoticed. At some point, somebody will see it and they'll give you a hand. Welcome to the Science of Building Champions podcast, where your host, Don Heatrick, chats with top-level fighters and coaches, diving into their stories to discover what makes champions. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Panikos Yusuf, two times world champion and coach and fighter at his gym, All Powers in, here in, uh, in Stockport in the UK. And not only that, he's a one championship athlete and a Yokao regular too. And that's why we're getting together here in person, which is the first time I've done that. So we'll see how this kind of all works out. This is ahead of Panikos fighting with Chris Shaw at Yokao 49. So thank you for for joining me Panikos. Thank you for having me. Having a chat today. So um, your story with for your Muay Thai training actually starts in Cyprus. So we're over here in the UK. How did Muay Thai start for you? How did you get going? I, um, I started when I was 16. Um, I've always been quite sporty. Um, I played football, basketball, I mean anything that was going at school. Uh, rode my bike everywhere and uh, and swam a lot because I lived on an island. Um, so I discovered it at the age of 16. I, I went to a gym to do some weights uh, during sc summer school holidays. And that's where I, I'd seen, I'd come across a guy hitting a bag with some really weird, you know, high pitched music playing in the background. And, uh, and I was interested. I thought it was kickboxing, of course. I've never heard of Thai boxing at the time. Um, so yeah, I approached him, um, who was my coach at the time, uh, Giriagos Christofi, who is also uh, the guy who, um, I don't know if you know Michael Savas? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so he, he, that's where he originated from as well. Oh, okay. um, yeah, from Giriagos Christofi, Lumpini, um, Lumpini Gym it's called in Cyprus. Uh, and then yeah, and then that's where it kind of all started. I, I, I got hooked within the first two weeks and then I just gave up everything all the sports I was doing on this uh, for school and I just, yeah, stuck to that. And so was the, the Muay Thai training something you were looking to competing right off the bat or was it something that kind of evolved? I took a fight two months in. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was just, I think I've, I've always wanted to do a contact sport since I was a kid. Um, so that I got signed up to a karate gym, Shotokan, and I did it for about six months, but it was really on and off uh, because... It was just a lot of like fresh air stuff. And, you know, when I look, you know, in hindsight, um, you know, I was seven or eight years old at the time. So, of course, they're not going to let us spar, you know. Right. Um, but, um, but yeah, I just got bored of it quite quickly. Uh, and then I just, I just, just doing a lot of different sports that I didn't really love, but I enjoyed doing because it was, you know, I, I just loved doing competitive sports. Um, and I think that's when I found Thai boxing and it filled, uh, it filled that void. Yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting how, how people test different sports out, don't they? And there's certain elements of certain sports, you're like, oh, I like this bit, but it's, there's still something missing. And it's a case of, of trying different sports until you find the one that actually fits you more personally as a whole. Correct. Yeah. Um, and I, I know I've had different contact sports that I've done and they all felt kind of good, but it wasn't until I started training in Muay Thai that it was like, actually, I feel like I'm, I'm using everything that I'm enjoying using here in this, mm. in this sort of training. And that's how it felt for you. Yeah, for sure. Because I had the option to go to boxing. Uh, but yeah, no, Thai boxing is always, has always been my, uh, my passion. I mean, if I wanted to make money, I'd be doing something different. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting with, with boxing though. So obviously um, the, the punches, the hands are, are one of the weapons that we use in Muay Thai. Um, but that we've got all these other things we can do as well. How do you feel when you're when you're just doing hands-only training, for example, compared to using all of the tools that you have with Muay Thai? 
Um, when so when when it comes down to training and we have to use hands, it's just having to change your whole stance and your whole movement and everything else. So all of a sudden you're slipping and you're rolling and your your legs are really wide apart and you know you you know and um, and the the way you the way you um, set up shots are differently and the way you move it is different to how you would if you were just doing a tie fight. Um, I find it very difficult to transition both together. I can either like, I can either kick or I can either just punch. I can't do both. Um, but yeah, I, I prefer to kick. That's my, that's my uh, go-to thing. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm pretty ugly anyway, so I'd rather not get punched in the face anymore <laughs> than I need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, um, I guess combat sports in general, it, there's there's not too many people that are really worried about their features. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've done quite well not not to defend with my face for a while. So, uh, but I don't know. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always this reminds me of when when I had my well my my early Muay Thai fights and how um, my mum in particular didn't want to watch me fight because she I guess she had this kind of image of like a, a rocky fight where you're just getting hammered in the face and it's kind of the one who <laughs> takes few, a slightly less punches to the head wins or something like that and it, and it wasn't until she, my, my dad was always like yeah very supportive but uh, my mum really wasn't too keen but then when she did come and see I think it was like my second or third fight um, and then saw that I was actually defending myself. It wasn't you just yeah. taking punches to the head, um, giving as good as you get and all that kind of stuff that she kind of like, oh, actually, I can I can see why you're attracted to it and reluctantly, but still g gave me the blessing, if you like, yeah. to kind of carry yeah. on with that. So, yeah, my mum's the same. She, My mum hates it. Um, um, the first few times I've always... Um, uh, she always arranged to come, but then she'd always walk out during my fight. And then I'd go up to her and say, oh, how did you fight? Oh, no, I'd left. And, you know, like I'd be looking for my mom and stuff and everybody would say, oh, yeah, she went out because she couldn't watch your fight. So I thought, that, right, well, there's no point in you trying to come to my fights anymore. Um, and um, I mean, even till now, like I've been doing this, what, 21 years or something like that, 22 years. And even now, like she's saying to me, oh, you need to stop soon. You need to stop soon. I'm like, mom, I love it. I love it. And I think sometimes I, I don't know. I don't know how much she, I don't know if she understands uh, how big of a deal I am in Thai boxing or like how much, I, how far I've gone into it. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's, um, but that's mothers for you, I suppose. Um, my dad loves it. And yeah, and dad's always encouraging me and stuff. But uh, yeah, my mom's. My mom's still like, oh, you're still time to get an office job or something. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of well, which, I mean, you, you run your own gym, you're coaching. So that that's kind of your career now as well as the, obviously yeah. there's the fighting as well. Mm -hmm. But like you say, there isn't a massive amount of money in that. We have to do other things as well. How did you actually end up in the coaching side of things? Um, so um, I did do some teaching um, in Cyprus, um, some kids classes and stuff like that. So I'd had some experience from then. Uh, and then I moved over when I was 19 and I trained for, I, I, I started at Master Skins originally because that's ah. all I knew. That's, that's the only gym I knew. And um, so then I found um, Paul Tite who run Stockport Tie Fighters at the time, who was also one of Master Skins students. And um, so I was with him for maybe four, five, six years maybe. And then he he was um, he wanted to retire to go to Thailand. So he was running a Thai restaurant here with his wife uh, and he just wanted to sell up and, and go and live that, you know, yes. uh, uh, the, the retirement life in, in Thailand. So he... So he, he pushed me to like, you know, to go for it. And I was like, oh, no, I'm scared. I was working at a call center at the time, which I hated. And, um, um, but it was just financial stability. And he was like, no, leave it, leave it. You'll be fine. You'll be all this. And I was thinking, yeah, but there's only a handful of students. And it's not always consistent. And, and obviously I hadn't um, had as many fights. So I've not built that reputation. had that exposure that, um, uh, that other fighters had. So when when i took over it was very hard for me i mean i was a good week was 150 pounds and yeah. uh, you know a slow week was 50 quid uh and i mean you know my, my wife carried us for for a few years for a few years uh and then slowly slowly i kind of started to build it up i stuck at it you know my, my, I, I was actually quite close there's a few times in the first two three years where i was actually thinking about um shutting it and just getting a full-time job or even just teaching part-time, you know, just teaching a few hours in the evening, but work a full-time job, which is what the majority of coaches do at the moment. Yes. Really. Um, 
but uh but my my wife was quite insistent on me like sticking at it and you know making it work and and I did you know I I, I fought a bit more um and you know I got a bit more exposure and I got that respect if if you like because like I say to to some of my other coaches the only qualifications for Thai boxing really is the fights or if you're a good coach who's or, or a coach who's maybe not had many fights or has had a good good career but you've built a good team you know we're reputable so those are the only two really qualifications for it otherwise who are you you know yes <laughs> yeah that it's it's great to hear that you've you've had such support from the family as well it's that's huge isn't it oh yeah most certainly like for me um it's the network that I've had around me. Uh, my wife, my, my a couple of my best friends who've supported me and, and taught me business, which was very important, <laughs> really, you know. And uh, because for me, I knew how to teach, but and I knew Thai boxing, but I didn't know how to run a business. I didn't know how to do books. I didn't know I had to make do returns and all that rubbish and make sure that there's toilet paper in the toilets and make sure that there's you know um you know wear and tear for the equipment and everything you know it's like uh so yeah i mean i was a kid i was i say i was a kid i was probably about 25 uh um all i knew was hard work and and through hard work i think my my efforts were were recognized you know and and and, and this is what i say to this is why i say to to other people, you know, when, when you work hard, it doesn't go unnoticed. People see it and you will get the support that you need, you know? Um, so you're never alone. And even though, yeah, it comes down to me as a person to work hard and get the job done. There are people around us to help us all the time. There will always be somebody. And if you don't feel like there is, it won't go unnoticed. At some point, somebody will see it and they'll give you a hand. Yeah. And, and somebody saw you at one championship. Yeah. How did that happen? And what's, what's that meant to you? So at one championship, it was actually through um, Stuart Tomlinson. Don't know oh, if you know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Stuart uh, is a really close friend of mine, and uh, he. So I went. I don't know if you know. I went into MMA for a year. That's right. I went over to MMA. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just felt like uh, after my man the, the fight with Manichai, I just thought like, where am I going with this? You know, I'm, I'm training hard. I'm working hard with this, and I'm. I don't see any any improvements in the financial side of it. I'm not seeing any um, uh, any uh, better opposition consistently, you know. And I'm just I just felt like I was I was plateaued almost. At, at, you know, at, at, you know, um, I couldn't go to Thailand and go and live out there for two three years and you know and build my experience because I did consider it. I did consider um, you know we were talking about it's with my wife, so she would be teaching uh, you know English because she had a tough course anyway. And, uh, and then I'd be training and fighting and then I could build my career up a bit more. Um, but then when I came back, I know nothing would change anyway. It'd still be the same. I'd still be making the same purse. I'd still be, you know, and, uh, so I thought I'd, I'd make a go of it in MMA. Um, I didn't retire as such from Thai. I just kind of thought I wanted to make a career change. Yeah. And, um, I'd always kind of dabbled in the MMA side of it. Because there, there was always MMA coaches in in the in the gym where, where that I taught out of, and so I'd always jump on and have a bit of a laugh and stuff, yeah. and I enjoyed it. It was fun, uh, and uh, so uh, I took my first fight, uh, I had four fights actually, uh, two wins, two losses. But the the problem was because I was a because of my Thai boxing career, my reputation, I couldn't just take an amateur fight. So I had to jump yeah, in with of course. purple yeah. belts with, uh, you know, brown belts <laughs> and guys who've been wrestling since they were kids. So it was very hard for me. Um, and then, uh, um, so I did that. And then Stuart said to me, um, oh, the one championship are doing tryouts for the Warrior Series. Uh, I don't know if you know that. The, yes. the, yeah. And um, so, um, so I applied and I got through and uh, I went to Japan. Uh, so I had a, there was a list of like countries you could do go to and trust me to go and pick Japan. You know what I mean? I could have gone for like Bangkok or something like that, which was probably not going to have as many good MMA guys or something. I don't know. True. Um, yes. You know, and uh, I went for, for Japan where they've got all these like um, great judokas and all this crazy things. And uh, uh, yeah, I ended up, there was 30 of us or just, just over 30 of us and we all been paired up with 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 whoever was there and i'd been paired up with this guy who was like a japanese judo champion or something ridiculous like that and uh, so they put us into situationals and stuff and uh, um 
So I was doing okay. And then I'd get turned over and I'd get thrown to the floor and then try and get up and all this. And they did stop us. And, uh, but they were impressed with my pad work. And that's what made, made me stand out. Um, so I was down to the last, the, the only, only picky five guys. And the, the last, the fifth person was between me and this other guy. And they ended up picking the other guy because of my lack of groundwork. Mm. So is it um, Forrest Griffin? Yes. Runs it? Yeah. He came up to me and said, look, he said, uh, you don't have to go through the, the tryouts again. Um, work on your grappling for the next three or four months, but really put a lot of work into it. Send me a video of you either competing or rolling, you know, free rolling and stuff. And if I feel that, if I see that you that you've made improvements and you you can, you know, you're at a good level, then I'll just sign you up. So I was like, yeah, cool, that's great, thanks. And so I went home, came back to England, and uh, uh, and then I had about two weeks in, two, two three weeks later, I had a, a message um, asking if I wanted to join the Super Series. So I was like, yeah, damn right. I thought <laughs> I get to do what I love now and get paid for it, you know? So, yeah. so you know, and I, so it can, I can, you know, it's, uh, you know, I don't have to worry financially for, you know, to, to go and train. Because the, the, the problem for me was, um, not necessarily the purse, but how much more money I was losing from not teaching and not being there. And then also yeah. it's when, I, uh, so I was, I'd always go out to Thailand to do my, my camps. So it'd take like six to eight weeks sometimes, uh, including the fights. And um, so all that expenditure there, and then I'm not here. So not everybody wants to train with the other coach, for example, do yeah. privates. And then also when I get back, it takes time to build everybody up again, make them aware that I'm back. So. Uh, so then it could go like 10, 10, 11, 12 weeks with where I've had lost quite a bit of money. So, um, so yeah, as much as I say that I do it out of the love, uh, you know, financially, I've got a, I've got a family to support as well. So, uh, it's got to make sense, you know, financial sense. Uh, so yeah, that's how, that's how I got about, uh, into one. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and now of course, more into the striking side of that rather than the the MMA side. Yes, yeah, yeah. They they did say that um if I ever wanted to switch over to MMA then I could con- they'd consider it for sure. Right. Uh but to be fair, I love Thai boxing and mm. you know and and that was my dilemma before I moved over to the MMA was like, well, I was trying to weigh things up. I'm not making any more money. I'm not like going to get this kind of a position all the time. So what what am I doing, Jeremy? Mm. Um now I'm 36 and I'm not as ambitious as, as I used to be. I don't care for the titles and for the number one spots. I'm happy uh, to be a part of it. I'm happy. I'm 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 loving the process, and I love I love you know going through it. Um, and not that I'm not gonna not that I'm not I've not got the intentions of winning tomorrow, but mm. um, yeah, I'm just happy to be uh, to to get in there and and have an opponent and fight. You know, yeah. especially after such a a big break. Yes, yeah, yeah, which has been rocking us all, hasn't it? Yeah, on and off. Yeah. And I've got a lot of um, fighters that I'm looking after online as well, and it's it's fascinating to see, you know, areas of the world are like we're back training, yes, yeah. and then equally at yeah. the same time, I get messages, oh, the gyms are shut, and mm. it's it's so it's just seesawing the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but getting back to kind of your love of, of Muay Thai and really wanting to gravitate gravitate back to that, um, what was it about Muay Thai that you kind of loved in the first place what what was it that drew you to that initially back in in cyprus it was the contact the right. actually hitting somebody that was what 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 drew me to it um because i've always wanted to um to do either do boxing or kickboxing or something that it required you know that that allowed you to hit somebody that, that was that was that was the truth of it yeah. simple as that yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah i'm with you yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> And and how has that evolved now? What is it, you know, after all these years that you've been doing it, what is it that you kind of love and appreciate about Muay Thai now that you perhaps didn't when you um, first started? What it's given me in life, I mean, it's the, the, the financial stability, the, um, I've met my wife through Thai boxing, you know, uh, the, my, how I've grown, grown mentally, spiritually and physically, you know, I've become a more confident person and not only, and, and the, obviously the people that I've met all around the world, and the network of people that I have around me that help me all the time. Not only that, now that I've been able to build and, and get to where I am, I have a good platform of which I can do the same for somebody else and help them get to where I was. Yeah. yeah. To me, that's, that's, that's the, like I say, like 
if you're rich and you got all these fancy watches and and Lamborghinis and it, nobody cares unless you're sharing or you're helping. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's uh, so yeah. If you've got a good platform, then use it. Use it to help others. Contribute. Don't just be selfish. <laughs> yeah, and and you can yeah. be kind of hungry like that. I guess yeah. when you're younger and you're you're trying to make a name for yourself. Yeah, but correct. It's... But this is it. Like this. Is what I mean, like I, I mean. <laughs> I came I came over to this country when I was 19. I came on a one way one one way ticket with 60 quid in my pocket and absolutely no idea of what I was going to do, you know. So I took a a valeting job 2 days in and you know and I, and and the thing is all I ever knew was hard work, you know. People may say that I'm talented and stuff, but all I know is hard work and if I want something it, I get it through hard work and you know and you got to dedicate that time, you got to put that discipline in as much as you do for your training to, you know. Um but, um, and now I've got a lovely house, you know, I've got, uh, you know, my car and whatever, and then and, and my, my, my family are, are safe and they're, you know, we're all got this financial stability. So now I can use this platform to help others, you know, and to help build, uh, to help build people to get to the same kind of frame of mind that I'm in, you know, yeah. uh, you know, to make them better people, you know, that's, you know, that, that's, that's all I want. And is that still why you you fight now and uh, or, and coach despite sort of all the challenges? That's yeah, why you're still in yeah, it. I love it, and uh, you know, and I, sometimes I forget that it can be inspiring to somebody else. I don't think that. I just think, oh, yeah, I'm just fighting for me, you know, because I, because I love it. Uh, but when I see other people wanting to fight, um, like my students want to do it and stuff, I'll, I'll push them just as much as my coaches have pushed me because I know what kind of a person it's made me. Uh, and I can see, I can see glimpses of, of, of where I was, you know, you know, times when people complain or, or, they, or they, they'll come up to me later on or they'll ring me up later and say, I can't do it. I'm struggling. And, and I understand cause I was there, you know, and, uh, not that I don't feel like that sometimes myself, but I can do, I can deal with it because I've been there that many times. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's one of those things, isn't it? You've if you've got that experience of how far to push, I mean, it was something we were talking about actually before, before we hit recording yeah. about recovery and all this kind of stuff as well. And, and I think as, as a, someone who's done it, you kind of know where those real limits are when overtraining is truly happening and when it's not, and when people actually need to kind of decide to push a bit harder. And I think that that kind of relative experience from someone who has done it, actually gives others the confidence to really find where their where their boundaries are if you're if you're there telling them actually there's there's more that you've got that you can dig mm. into um when they don't believe there is because they've mm. never pushed that far to find it yeah. um i think that's a really important thing yeah correct and and i think the main thing is having faith in your coach you know like i've always had faith in my coaches and my coach said to me right there's a fight in two weeks yep i wouldn't even consider thinking about it so yeah if you know if my coach believes in me to do it it, it thinks i'm ready in in two weeks to take this fight now i'm going to take it um uh, even if it doesn't matter if i believe that or not do you know what i mean i just had the faith in my coach and uh, uh so when the coach says keep going keep your mouth shut and keep your head down and just get on with it you don't need to complain you don't need to tell me that something's hurting i can see i know and you know the coaches know and that's why they continue to push the way they push because they want you to get past that barrier. They want you to get past those limits, you know? Um, but yeah, uh, and then sometimes, yeah, they they need that extra rest, like you say, but how can you know what your limits are if you don't push past the time when you're most exhausted and you can't carry your arms anymore and you can't hold your neck up and your head up anymore because your neck feels like, you know, your neck feels like it's gonna snap off uh, or your legs feel like you know, it's gonna collapse. Just carry on. If your coach says carry on, you carry on. You know, and, and I always find with when I teach, when I train fighters, I always push them the hardest the fir- within the first five to 10 fights because uh, uh, as in um, to the point where they're almost overtraining and coming back uh, and want it, wanting them to get winded, wanting them to get, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, dead legs and, you know, and go hard on with the boxing just so they can experience it all because I don't want anything to be a surprise when they jump in there. You know, it's, they've been there already. Oh, I got winded. It's fine. I've been there. You know, it, it's not, it's normal. As I remember getting winded once and I just like, I've never felt anything like it. Oh my God. It was, it was a fight against Andy Thrasher. And, uh, yeah, I just, I think I took a left body kick and I was like, 
and I, and I thought, that, yeah, I just couldn't breathe. Uh, but if I'd been winded in the gym maybe a few times and, you know, hit hard, then maybe I would have been able to deal with it a bit better. But after that, like, I understood, like, right, okay, well, there's things. And now I, I pretty much get winded every fight, but I just, I'm used to it now. It's normal, isn't it? It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one of the sensations of a fight. Mm. Yeah. I'd love to know what you think are the, the key traits or characteristics that a champion needs to be successful. Like, I mean, as I'm sure you've seen, there are a lot of good talents that come into the gym and leave, uh, mm. who are not willing to put in the work. Uh, and for me, if I was to choose one thing, it would just be hard work, hard workers. And I would much rather put all my time in the one person who shit but he turns up to every single session on time and is there till the end and wants to do everything that I say uh, over the guy who is amazing, but is lazy. So if it's one trait, it would be hard work. Um, and it doesn't matter, for me, it doesn't matter if, 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 if one of my fighters don't make it, you know, to number one in the UK or world champion. It's not about that for me. It's about making them a better person, making them stronger mentally and physically. And then anything they do in life is not just not quite as hard as Thai boxing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, for me, that's it's hard work over talent and everything else, I think. I mean, yeah, talent does play a big role of it, uh, but hard work, hard work. Because if, you, if you're willing to put the hard work in, you can get really far. And I think that's something as a coach you recognize in people, don't you? You kind mm. of, you realize, like you say, you mentioned the Muay Thai side of things, but then outside of Muay Thai as well, and how mm. that attitude is a habit that you, you carry into mm. everything that you do. Yeah. And you can kind of tell how people react in training when it starts mm. getting tough, how they're going to react to pretty much other obstacles in life mm. as well. I, I always, I, I mean, Thai boxing is like my, everything revolves about around Thai boxing for me. I mean, like I, like when I, when I, when I, the way someone conducts themselves in training gives me a kind of like, um, gives me an indication of how they are in life almost, you know, mm. if you give up then I can tell like what kind of a character you are. If you talk back, then I can tell what kind of character, or you're the kind of person that blames everyone for, for your, for your shortcomings. Or your, you know what I mean? Like yeah. in the almost, um, so yeah, like where the way people train for me, I can tell how they are character wise. And also it gives me a kind of like a benchmark as well. Like if I, if I see someone, I'll push everyone equally and I'll push someone and I'll shout at them. And if they, I don't know, roll their eyes or say something back, then I think, right, okay, so I know not to and not to say anything to you anymore. So I'll, I'll put my efforts in somebody else. You know what I mean? So, yes. and, and I'll do that once and I'll do that twice. And if it keeps happening, then I'll just, yeah, I, I just tend to kind of like, well, if if you don't appreciate my my help. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is, you're investing your effort in people, exactly. aren't you? And yeah. when you get a return on that, that's... That, that's something I've found as a coach that's really, that's something you don't get when you're a fighter, but it equally lights you up, doesn't it? When mm. you get that person that's kind of reflecting and bouncing back at you and, and absorbing what you're, what you're trying to share and, and mm. seeing them develop from it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and, and also like, um, they're a reflection of me, you know? <laughs> so if they're not throwing a kick properly, then of course I'm going to be pissed off, you know, and I'm going to shout <laughs> if they're, you know, and, uh, like that, a lot, oh, I mean, they've, they've all complained about me not giving enough, um, praise. And I say, <laughs> look, I say, if I teach you how to punch and you punch, then great. If you, if you, if I teach you how to kick and you kick, then great. You're doing what the fuck I told you <laughs> you're supposed to be doing anyway in the first place. So why do you want praise for something you're meant to be doing? Does your boss give you praise every time you do your job? No, because that's what you're supposed to be doing. So don't be asking for praise, you know? Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I do recognize that sometimes that I don't, I should sometimes tell people that I'm proud and, you know, well done and stuff and give them a little bit of praise, but not too much because I don't want it to get to the head. And plus when I do give that little bit of praise, it goes a long way, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, generally it's just shouting. <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah, like I said, it's, they, they're, a, they're a reflection of me, you know? So when they do something, uh, they, when they're doing like beautiful, clean clinical technique and they're doing well, that's great. Cause that's what I want to see, you know? And, and, and I love when I see some of my students uh, showing somebody else stuff, uh, and the way they show in it and the way they deliver in it. And it just made, I just always think that's, yeah, it's great because that's a reflection of me, you know, yeah. it's, it's great. Yeah. And and that actually teaching it to somebody else 
I find that you just learn so much again by trying to show someone else how to Correct. do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've become a better fighter from teaching and vice versa, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's finding a way of communicating with people with different kind of, I guess, life experiences, so stuff that just sunk in for you. Mm. Either the pattern was familiar to you anyway because of other sports you did, so you just got it like that. Some people's bodies just haven't experienced a movement pattern mm. before. So, you know, yeah. for example, I mean, like the difference between the men and the women throwing punches mm. and stuff like that. If, if you've got a, a woman who's been throwing things in sports, she can throw a punch, you know, mm. if she's never thrown something before. And it's the same with the fellas. Yeah. You know, there's, there are these movement patterns that just translate yeah. across. Yeah. Um, but, but equally, you know, it's, it's, it's those, those movement patterns, but also the, the metaphors that mean something to people. Mm -hmm. So s some metaphors yeah. I use with people to, and they like, got it. And other ones, I just look at you like, yeah. doesn't mean nothing. Yeah. I am. Um, so I, I was very like military style teaching, like you do in Thai <laughs> boxing and it was, this is the way you do it. And this is how I'm showing it. Um, and, if, and, and, and I used to think that people were stupid for not getting it, you know? And, uh, and I was like, why oh, is so thick? Why is he not getting this technique? And then I'd realized later a few, a few years down the line that, you know, it's, it's not about it's, it's not that people are thick. It's just that everybody learns different. And mm. it's not the student that needs to change how they're learning. It's it's me. It's me as a coach. I just need to have a different approach. So I started being, becoming a little bit more patient and, 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 you know, and like, and analyzing that, you know, like when I'm showing the technique, when I've shown the technique so many times uh, and it's still not sinking in, I'm thinking, right, well, I have to diff try a different approach. I'm going to try to do this, you know, that um i've realized that yeah it's not always a student it's sometimes it's me you know and and it's good and and i still learn i still learn from teaching beginners i still learn from teaching you know more experienced guys uh i still learn from sparring and yeah i'm always picking up things you know and uh even it, it, not necessarily anything new but it's just a different perspective or a, 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 a or a new way that i've learned uh to show a uh, a different variation of a technique, for example, you know. Yeah, yeah. Almost, you you found the 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 shortcut to kind of I can get people to do this quicker now. Yeah. It, when they're struggling with it, I've now got a different way of communicating this. Mm. Going back to sort of struggles now, I'd love to know what you feel your sort of big, biggest obstacles or struggles have been in your time in Muay Thai and and what you've learned from them. Um. It, my biggest obstacles in Thai boxing probably have been my camps, like getting, getting the time to, not getting the time to train, but getting the right um, cover uh, for my classes. Yes. Um, and also from a financial point of view, you know, because like, you know, there's no money, <laughs> and there is no many, there isn't many sponsors as as as, as such, and. The only sponsors you get in Thai boxing are generally people that know you personally. Um, so I would say like I found the, the hardest during camps because it meant that I would be selfish and I'd get away, I'd go away from a family. And I try to find kind of decent cover for the gym. Uh, students would help out where they could. Um, but generally people wouldn't turn up because I wasn't there. And uh, now, however, I built a good coaching team um, and yeah, just, they're just great. They're amazing. And, uh, uh, yeah, I've got a good network of people around me that help out, you know, my wife, my, my, my sister-in-law even. And, uh, uh, I've got my, my really close friend, Ricky Sewell, who's my Padman, uh, you know him and, uh, um, and yeah. And then, and then my coaches, the coaches that teach for me now, I've got, uh, three coaches, um, and, uh, yeah, they're just very good. Very yeah. good. Yeah. I can trust them to, I can go away and I can trust that they'll be good with the people. Do you know what I mean? Because not everybody's, you know, good at interacting with, 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 you know, with people. They can teach a class, but they're not necessarily um, customer based. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. dealing with personalities yeah, 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 all yeah, the time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you could go back in time and change anything about your approach to your to your Muay Thai training or, or coaching, would there be what would what would be the thing that you would change? Uh, I don't know. There's there's nothing really that I think that would change. If if anything, uh, I wish I was where I am now from the beginning. You know, <laughs> that would have been great. Uh, but um, <laughs> but yeah, no, no, nothing really. Nothing I would have changed. Um, I mean, I think I I met the right 
coaches and the right people at the right time and and it's helped to develop me and get to where I am um so yeah there's nothing really that I would necessarily change it, it tends to be the case doesn't it even the even the stuff that you feel at the time wasn't good you always feel like there's there's something I learned and and grew from as a result of that mm. and it's it's kind of difficult to think even if it was a bit ouch at the time whatever it was it's like it still made me end up at the journey I'm at now yeah I mean um um people generally ask me um which one my which is my which was my toughest fight and mm. when I think I always think oh every fight's kind of um presented its own challenges and I've learned from them but when I really pinpoint down to one fight it was against Greg Wharton, Greg Wharton. and we both had um uh, uh, you know a series of wins you know back to back wins and stuff and uh, so we fought and I thought I was pretty decent and until he threw me around like ragdoll in the clinch <laughs> I didn't realize that I needed to work that much in my clinch and and that's when I'm uh, uh um it was there was the transi transition of Paul, my coach at the time, who was retiring and then he needed to find a new gym. So I went to, um, um, to I don't know if you ever heard of him, Liam Robinson. Yes. Yeah, I used yes. to train with him and uh, and that's where I improved my clinch, you know, but I wouldn't have probably made that jump unless I, you know, unless that ever happened. You know what I mean? If that never happened, I would have probably thought I was the dog bollock still, you know? Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> so sometimes you need a good spanking to, you know, to come into realization of certain things and yeah. Um, and yeah, I've generally now nowadays it's me giving the spanking, but <laughs> I, yeah, um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah it, that that was the one that's really changed my career. I felt like made the biggest change in me uh, yeah. as a fighter. That that was a learning opportunity. Mm. That one, yeah, yeah. Something that I've noticed, and I, I don't know if this is evolving more of, or if it's just me kind of observing it more. You, you've mentioned Liam Robinson. Um, I've spoken to Dan McGowan and. Dr. Tony Myers, Professor Tony Myers now. Um, and there's these sort of common characters. And it's it's people from different gyms, but sharing experience. And that that's something that rather than being all competitive with each other, and it's it's something I'm kind of noticing more on social media these days as well. There are people cross-training with with different coaches in different gyms and they're, they're sharing stuff rather than like guarding it. And it's like, this is what we do at our gym, top secret, don't share it. It's seems to be everyone's really trying to rebound everybody's level. And I'm loving that. It's, and I know you're, you're a big part of, of this as well. I'm seeing you training with, with like Jack Kennedy and all these different people as well. Yeah, you, for sure. About yeah. That? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's great to see that because, um, we don't get paid enough money. We don't get paid through pay-per-views and all that crap. So <laughs> there is no reason for us to be doing all the trash talk and have bad blood between us. You know, it's like with Chris Shaw, like I hadn't seen him in years and stuff. And it was just great to see him. I mean, genuinely great to see him. I, I have nothing, nothing but love for him, you know? Yeah, we're going to go and we're going to fight and we're going to try and hurt each other. But after that, we'll be friends again, you know? It's not... Uh, um, and I, you know, if the opportunity ever arises, I'll happily train with him, you know, mm. with, with anyone I've, I have no, um, yeah, there's, it's just, I think, um, sometimes we let our, our egos get in the way, you know, and I, back then, I think a few years ago, like it was more about, no, you can't go to other gyms. You've got to stick here. And it was only between one or two gyms. Maybe you'd go, um, um, but yeah, now it seems to be a bit more open, you know, and it's good. And there's a lot more kids, um, involved in it now. So there's a lot more buddies to spar with and clinch with, you know? And, um, so yeah, it's, it's great to see. It's good to see for sure. Um, sometimes I may think that some people go to too many gyms, <laughs> uh, <laughs> when they're, in, when they're in mid camp, but, uh, right. but it's entirely up to them. It's whatever makes them feel or, or uh, whatever they feel that will get them ready, they do. You know, everybody's different, like we, we spoke about before with the nutrition and everything. Um, if they need, feel they need to travel every single gym in the country, then and to be ready, then that's what it takes, you know? Who am I to judge, you know? I'm not the one who's jumping in for, for, for that person. Yes. Um, so, yeah, for me, um, generally, I go to Thailand and I do six-week camp out there. Uh, but obviously I've not been able to this time. Um, so I decided to train with John Pop. Uh, so I've been between John Pop and, and my gym with Ricky Sewell. Um, I was meant to be 
doing my camp with Jack Kennedy because I help him with his camps and stuff. Yes. Uh, but he'd obviously had his injury and stuff, so he'd been out. Um, but yeah, there's there's been a few good buddies that've been coming down to John Pops as well, and yeah, it's it's been um, it's been really good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I say, it's great that people travel in spa, and and I encourage my students to do that as well. Um, uh, you know, the ones who are fighting, you know, yes. when, they, when they're not got a fight coming up, you know, just go, you know, have a spa with the gym. If they're okay with it, then yeah, it's fine. I'm not precious about it, you know. Mm. Um, it's for their own development anyway. Because I remember when I was younger and, and I used to need partners all the time to spa with and I used to go to GFC and stuff and, and it was just great. Like, um, yeah, so whatever it takes to make you better. That's yeah. It, you know? <laughs> I think it's a really interesting point you made about being in a fight camp though because there definitely can be a too many cooks spoil the broth yeah can't there if you're if you're trying to filter for what's relevant and if there's too many different kind of uh too many different influences being thrown in it can end up kind of scattering yeah you. for sure i mean you know how long it takes for someone to synchronize for a pad man and fighter to synchronize mm -hmm. it's not easy you, you can't go full power with somebody you've never hit before you need to kind of get used to the movements, the patterns, the what they come back with, how they where they want you to step off and stuff. So you, and it generally takes a few pad sessions. So, but if you're doing one pad session here with this guy, and you do another pad session over there, do another pad session over there. Pad, with sparring, it doesn't matter so much because yeah, it's good because you want to be, you know, going through situationals and going through every different scenario with different you know styles and stuff. That that makes sense, you know, and and the clinch side of it. But with padding, I think it's hard. I think you need to stick with, because how can one coach help improve you if you're not doing more than one session with them, <laughs> you know, in a week, for example? Yes. Yeah, yeah there's definitely yeah. that bedding in yeah. period. Yeah. I'd be interested to know what's changed in your fight preparation since you first started up until now? Uh, probably a lot of trial and error with my with my diet. Um, um, <laughs> Yeah, I've tried the I've tried the whole vegan thing. I it didn't work for me. <laughs> um, but I'm like I said to you, I'm a bit more mindful about what I do and how what what I eat and how you know when I um, my sleep patterns and everything. Um, uh, as I'm a little, as I've grown a little bit older now, and I'm 36, I can't just eat whatever I want and go to sleep and then feel fine the next day. So um, so yeah, so I've cut out a lot of stuff like say bread and milk and uh, alcohol and. Uh, so, um, I tend to eat, um, uh, meat maybe three times a week, four times a week, and then I'll have, and the rest of the time I'm pretty much veggie, uh, and high fats as well. Um, and I've probably incorporated strength and conditioning properly <laughs> for the last eight months, nine months now. Um, I used to just kind of do the odd session here and there, you know, but yeah. never like properly, never with a program or a course and that. Um, so I've taken, uh, so uh, I've taken on a coach and he put me on a proper course and stuff. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much what I've done different. I mean, I know I can't, there's certain things maybe that I can't do that I used to be, that I used to be able to do and especially the volume of work that I used to be able to do in one session. Um, I recognize that, but then I also recognize that I'm stronger and more wise than I was before. You know, I've got more experience and there's certain things, certain attributes that I've acquired that, you know, that make up for those. So, um, I used to kind of like beat myself up about how, Oh yeah, I'm 36, I'm 35 or whatever. And, um, I'm getting on now. My knees a bit sore. My back's a bit sore. Oh, I can't run as much as I, c I could before. And I couldn't, I can't, don't move the same as, and I've almost kind of like ingrained it into my mind without realizing that, like I put into my subconscious and I've persuaded myself that I was old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, um, so, and then I was thinking one day, well, why is it that there's, UFC champions at the, in mid forties and iron men and iron women in the fifties. And, you know, and all these people in the Olympics who are, you know, over, and I was thinking, it's just me. I, it's not my body. It's, it's not because I, 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 I'm old. It's because I've, you know, I've, I've persuaded myself that I am, you know? So like now I just wake up, I, I go to bed and, and I do my affirmations and I'll say, you know, um, um, I'll say, you know, like, I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to have a good good, good day tomorrow. I wake up and I'm, I say I'm in beast mode. I'm going to have a good day today. You know, I, I don't, I don't even joke around anymore about being old. I don't joke around about feeling like shit, nothing. I, Cause 
there's no I'm not lying to myself I just think yeah just there's no need for it you, know? you can end up focusing on that mm. can't you and it's a stigma that everybody kind of puts on you because it's like wait till you're my age you know and and I am that age now you know and it's like well it's do I want to be that or do I want to be feel like I'm younger and that's what I want to feel I want to feel like I'm old I want to feel like I'm younger and that's who I am I feel like I'm younger and I'm not not trying to persuade myself I do feel it I feel mm. genuinely good yeah you know I feel better than I know that I'd kick 25 year old Panikos' ass you know <laughs> right now yeah, so it's not yeah I think that's the thing, isn't it? You, um, as you get older, you can't afford to be as wasteful. That's the thing. Yeah, correct. When you're younger, you can just yeah. waste energy yeah. willy nilly, yeah. and actually, you don't realise that you're kind of creating wear and tear that's happening. Then mm. that you you won't actually discover until you're a bit older. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, I damaged that, but because I was younger, yeah. that was that was hidden. It yeah. kind of comes. It's almost like a snowdrift melts, yeah. and you start feeling like, oh, yeah. okay, yeah. and it's like actually. I prematurely wore that out doing silly shit early on. I didn't need to do any of that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that's interesting as you get older. You start to realize what's the stuff that makes a difference, what doesn't. And it's it's not like um, bragging how many hours you've been training. It's like it's getting the right stuff done at the right time, isn't it? And then backing off again to let the effect of that actually work and not just feel like I've just got to have the most hours on the on the tally sheet here. Yeah, yeah, correct. It's just being efficient and and being smart about how you train. Uh, like I said, I I recognize that I I realize that I can't do the ten kilometers before twenty minutes of skipping and then bad work, bag work and then getting on the pads for five rounds of four minutes and then do my sparring clinch after and then finishing off with sprints. I can't do that anymore. Um, you know, I could if you know at a push, but why? I know it's not for me. It's, it's and, and where I am with my body, I know it's not efficient. You know, uh, so yeah, it's just being smart and knowing, like you say, what works and what doesn't. Um, yeah, so yeah, just doing the necessary training and then cutting out all the unnecessary crap. And does that help you then with uh, even your younger fighters, kind of steering them towards the things that make a difference rather than kind of, I can see you're going down that route. I I had done and I, I wasted effort doing that. Yeah, correct. And uh, there's a lot of times where I've had to tell my fighters to not go running, you know, don't run, just stay in, just do the session. And, and they feel like they're not doing a full session because they're not running. Um, or, you know, I might say to them, just go home. You don't need to train anymore. You know, like at the end of the session, they don't have to stay behind and do their 300 sit-ups and whatever it is that the tires make you do. Um, so, yeah, and and it's, yeah, it's that. But And you can see sometimes there's a bit of like, you know, they're, they're a bit, yeah, taken aback by it. But um, that's it. You just got to trust your coach because, yeah, sometimes they know. Yeah. Sometimes, well, sometimes they don't. But yeah, but generally they, you know, it's putting that faith in your coach because they can see when, you know, when you're tired and when you're not and what you need to do differently generally. Yeah. And, and when you've got the credentials like mm -hmm. you have, it makes yeah. it easier for them to trust yeah. it. And for me, like, I'm still learning, you know. Yeah, I might have all this experience, but I'm always open. I'm always mm. open to learn, you know. If one of my students come up to me and say, oh, what do you think about it? Yeah, I'm up for it, you know. Like, yeah, please, you know. I don't claim to be anything, you know. <laughs> anything that I've learned, I've just learned through Thai boxing. That, you know, for me, I've blagged it all, this, all these years, you know. I don't have any qualifications whatsoever. Nothing in nutrition, nothing in sports or, or, or training or type. Of, no, you know, I've just trained and I've, and I've done things and I've trialed and errored them and I know what works and what don't, doesn't. But then I also, under, I also recognize that certain things that work for me don't work for somebody else. So it's not one, one size fits all, you know. So I, I, that's up to me as a coach to be open-minded and analyze things and try a different approach you know, to, to, to the same thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. It, finally, if there was one thing that you could, one bit of advice you could give to someone who wants to be as successful as they can be, just one thing, one what thing would that be? One thing would be hard work. That's it. There's nothing, nothing else. Hard work. One thing that my parents have taught me, you know, like is, is, is hard work. I've started working at the age of seven. My dad took me doing valeting and stuff with him. And it was seven in the morning till seven at night. And then every summer holiday, I was not allowed to go and chill with my friends and go to the beach and everything. I had to take on a job. And it was, I was always working with say some, an acquaintance of my dad and stuff. And, um, and yeah, just growing up, I always had a job during the school holidays. And then that's all I've known was hard work. Um, and, and that's what's led me to my success. I believe that that's, that's all this. I mean, yeah, you need the intelligence and the, te and the talent is all, is all important, but 
without the hard work, you're going nowhere. Yeah. That's your foundation. Correct. Yeah. Foundation is hard work. Love it. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. And, and all the best putting on a really great show with, with Chris Short. Thank you very tomorrow. much. I'm looking forward to seeing you both in there. Yeah. As everybody is, because of all the all the lockdowns and stuff mm. we've had, we're just itching to see some some quality fights like you guys can put on. And thank you for taking the time out before that to come and have a chat with me. Oh, I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. And is there any um, social media uh, addresses or, or accounts you want to, to um, point this to? I mean, I've got an Instagram account. It's called Panikos Yusuf. Um, or you could follow me on... Um, Facebook, which is Panic Cost Super Patch. I mean, I don't really post many things. Uh, generally, when I've got a fight camp, um, people will record me, so then I'll just share pretty much. I don't really post much of my own things. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, like um, sometimes people will message me and ask me for questions, you know, regarding a certain technique or maybe a situation. I'm happy to answer. No, yeah. Sometimes I might take a little bit long to answer, but. I will answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you can rack them up a bit, yeah, can't you? Yeah. Especially when this is online. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, mate. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you found this valuable, please like, subscribe, and share with someone else it could help too. Please give the podcast a review or comment below. We'd love to hear from you. As always, you can visit heatrick.com for more Muay Thai performance podcasts, videos, articles, and guides. Catch you next time.